What you're about to experience is one man's quest to see beyond the tumultuous period we're in and to envision what lies just beyond our grasp, yet well within our reach. Welcome to Larry Rifkin's America Trends, where the future has arrived, and it's just in time. David Wallace Wells is on the line with us. The book is called The Uninhabitable Earth, Life After Warming. And your article, David, in New York Magazine back a couple of years really got a lot of attention because you put the issue of climate change, global warming into profoundly human terms. Were you surprised that such a telling had the impact that it did? Well, I expected it to find a readership, maybe even a big readership, because I wrote it in part to test some thoughts I had had about the sorts of rhetorical tools that had been left on the table by people who were writing about climate um, going back over the past few decades. And I thought that if one was able to tell the story a little bit differently, a little more urgently, with a little more, um, a little more cinematic flair and a little more humanitarian feeling, that there would be an audience for that kind of piece. I felt that because I wanted to read that kind of piece, and I imagined there would be other people like me. So when I wrote it, I expected there to be an audience for it, but I was, you know, kind of overwhelmed by just how big that audience turned out to be. It's it's no longer the most read piece that New York Magazine has ever published. That happened that it was passed by an excerpt that, of Michael Wolff's Fire and Fury that we published, but for a while it was. And considering how for so long climate stories were considered to be real turnoffs to readers, kind of traffic kryptonite, I think that's a real testament both to how much potential there is in this new kind of storytelling about climate and also how hungry the public is now for any good writing, any important, any urgent writing about climate in a way that may not have been the case even just a couple of years ago. I think that the the climate conversation is, is moving that fast and that much. So what's the problem, Ben, as it relates to communicating this climate science? I will say that I've said for a long time, the fact that it all started Uh, with Al Gore, let's say, in many people's minds, and it was uh, on a politician's lips that this came as opposed to a Carl Sagan or someone else who could explain things, science in a way that we could understand, or that we were always talking about it in places that were far away or what was going on in the Arctic, that there was a lot of uh, miscommunication. What would you say is the reason that we've had such uh, inability to connect on this issue? Well, I think it's it's a really complicated question with many, 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 many different answers. So I think among them, the psychological biases and reflexes that all of us have, including me, to look away from scary possibilities and to believe, to hope that we won't have to face them squarely. But I think that the storytelling is a part of it. And I think that there were basically three major shortcomings when it comes to most of the storytelling, I would say, starting in the 90s through um, up until a year or two ago. And that is, the first one is about the speed of change. I think we were told that it was a problem that was going to hit us um, at the very earliest, much later this century, and maybe even in subsequent centuries. And so we didn't have to worry about it in terms of our own lives. We probably didn't even have to really worry about it in terms of our children's lives, but only at beginning at the timeline of our grandchildren's lives. And I think that allowed us to think that We could grow our way out of the problem. We could invent our way out of the problem. But in any event, it was so distant that it wasn't an urgent pressing matter today, and an additional delay of one or two or even 10 years wouldn't make much of a difference. But half of all of the emissions that we've put into the atmosphere in the entire history of humanity from the burning of fossil fuels have come in the last 30 years. That's since Al Gore published his first book on warming. It's since the UN established its big climate change commission, the IPCC. And that means that we've done more damage to the planet knowingly than we ever managed in ignorance, that we were able to bring the planet from basically a stable climate as it was about 30, 35 years ago to 
the brink of catastrophe in just the time of 30 years. And we are doing, we're continuing to do damage at that speed, which means that the next decade or the next decade or two are just as consequential and will have just as much of an impact as the last few. What that means is that if we had, if it took us about 30 years to bring the planet to the brink of catastrophe, we now have probably about 30 years to solve it, which means we're going through this drama very much in real time and with extreme weather we're seeing those impacts immediately. So speed is the one big misunderstanding. The second one is about scope. I think, as you mentioned, we heard a lot about sea level rise and Arctic ice melt, I think in part because scientists felt that that was the clearest and in certain ways scariest Mm. um, climate impact. But I think it allowed most of the world, anyone who lived off the coast, to believe if we didn't live on the coast, we'd be safe. The more we know about all of the ways that climate change will impact us, the more we know about its economic impacts, which could um, cut global GDP by 20 or even 30 percent by the end of the century compared to a world without climate change. 30 percent is twice the scale of the Great Depression, and it would be permanent to public health impacts, to conflict. If we end up at the end of the century um, at four degrees of warming, which is where we're headed, we should have twice as much war as we have today. We would have the permanent loss of all Arctic and Antarctic ice sheets, which could bring eventually over many centuries 200 feet of sea level rise or more. Extreme weather, droughts, wildfires, the California wildfires that so horrified people last year. There are some scientific projections that if warming continues unabated, wildfire burn would increase 64 times over by the end of the century. And last year, more than a million acres were burned. That just gives you a sense of how completely transformed this world will be, no matter where you are, no matter how far from the coast you live. Mm. And that was the second big misapprehension, that this is not a, a, a thing that was a threat that was limited in scope, but all pervasive, all encompassing, and would impact every aspect of human life on the planet. And then the third thing was the severity. You know, a lot of scientists talk about two degrees as this catastrophic level of warming. It's a level of warming that island nations of the world call genocide. And so the lay reader, even the person who is relatively engaged on the issue, could think that, well, two degrees is about as bad as it could possibly get. Practically speaking, at this point, two degrees is now a best case scenario for us. And as I mentioned before, we're now on track for about four degrees of warming. And that range, that two to four degree range, just had not really been closely looked at by any by anybody who was really writing and talking about this issue. And that meant that the whole spectrum of likely outcomes for you and me and our children for the rest of the century had been basically unexplored, even by those people who were writing about climate most vividly, most considerately, many of whom I admire enormously. But those are the three big misunderstandings, misapprehensions, and it allowed us to think that climate change was distant in time, that it was distant in place, and that it would be limited in its impacts. All three of those ideas are misguided, and all three of them have given us a a false sense of complacency about how quickly we need to act. We need to move much, much more quickly than almost anyone appreciates. The UN says to avoid that catastrophic level of warming, we would need to have global emissions by 2030. That's very fast. That's a really dramatic undertaking. They say it would require a global mobilization at the scale of World War II, and we need to start that this year. So that just gives you a sense of just how dramatic a threat we're facing and just how dramatic a response is required to avert levels of warming that until very recently, all of the scientists of the world understood as unconscionable, even though now we understand them as functionally inevitable. Well, the Paris Climate Accords, of course, we pulled out of that. So are we backsliding toward this dystopian future that you imagine? Yeah, the, climate, the, the Paris Accords, you know, we're just a few years in, and I, I think we do have to judge them, at least at this stage, a failure. No major industrial nation in the world is on track to meet its commitments under Paris, and even if we did, we'd still end up north of three degrees. Now, there were built into that, those agreements some mechanisms for future commitments and ratcheting up those commitments going forward, but given the sh- current shape of our geopolitics, it's hard to imagine the next few years, at least, Um, producing renewed commitment to liberal internationalism and global cooperation in a positive some way. We're seeing more and more zero-sum thinking between nations. We're seeing more nations retreat from things, you know, organizations like the UN and the EU retreating into nativism and xenophobia, building walls, etc. And that's really especially dispiriting because 
if you had to imagine a threat that was big enough, all-encompassing enough to really call all the nations of the world into cooperation, climate change would be it. And yet, as, as we're entering the real crisis phase for climate, the world is behaving in the opposite way. And that's really distressing. I don't know if it's permanent. I don't know how long that trend will last. But for the time being, it's certainly undermining our ability to address the issue. And the longer we wait to reverse those trends, the less time we'll have to really take action. David Wallace Wells, and his book is called The Uninhabitable Earth. Remind us how poor people are going to feel these cascades from climate change affecting them, you say, earliest and harshest, and how the rich over time won't be able to, well, buy their way out of this crisis. Well, I think we're already seeing that, you know, Many parts of the world are being pummeled by climate change, especially the equatorial band of the world in the global south are already dealing with widespread drought, um, heat waves that you and I would find unlivable or, you know, impossible to, to endure. This is happening quite regularly in the global south, and most of us in the relatively wealthy corners of the West basically ignore that suffering. I think that is a sort of a projection of how we're likely to deal with the immensely intensified suffering that we're likely to see over the coming decades. But it will also be the case that you won't be able to escape this no matter where you are for some of the reasons that I mentioned earlier. If the global GDP is really 30% smaller than it would be without climate change, that will be an impact that affects all of us. But it will affect us unequally. So even if Americans and Brits and people in the EU are frustrated and you know, staggering through an economic environment in which 1% growth is considered really positive because we're dealing, fighting off so many of the impacts of climate change. There are whole parts of the world where the very possibility of economic growth will be totally eliminated by the forces of climate change. And what that means for how we relate to history, how much faith we place in the future, I think these are really open questions. And it's some of the most exciting stuff for me that I try to write about in the book is not just what the direct impacts of climate change will be, but how it will transform the way that we all live together on this planet, what it will mean for our politics, for our relationship to capitalism, for our relationship to technology, our sense of history, our storytelling, our pop culture, all that stuff. I think those impacts may end up being as profound or more profound than, for instance, the extreme weather, the wildfires, even the economic impacts and the conflict impacts, because you know, it will probably be the case that human civilization will endure in some recognizable form going forward. But what form, in what way, with what points of orientation emphasis, I think these are really open questions. I think climate change is such a powerful force that it won't leave any aspect of our life untouched. But exactly what form it leaves that life in, I Hmm. think, is, is a fascinating open question. To those who are still deniers, I mean, you remind us in this book how much we've already lost as a harbinger of worse to come. And I don't know if people really put together uh, these unquenchable fires in California or these hundred year floods that seem to come with greater rapidity than ever before. I mean, people just don't necessarily put that together. They say, oh, you know, that happens all the time, extreme uh, weather. I mean, what do you say to them? Well, I, you know, I think all of the data says that that's not accurate, that we're seeing much more of this um, than we've ever seen before. You know, we're seeing Last year, we saw an unprecedented heat wave. It was global in scope. The entire northern hemisphere was walloped by it. There were deaths as far, you know, in Canada, there were deaths in the Middle East. There were deaths in Russia from it. You know, we've, we just saw the first February Pacific typhoon in recorded history. There have been times when there were three or four or five hurricanes in the planet's oceans at once. That's never been seen before. The wildfires in California every year were setting a new record. Now, it's not to say that these are literally unprecedented in the sense that we have had wildfires before, we have had hurricanes before, we have had heat waves before, but they're getting more intense and the period between them are shrinking. So just to give one very vivid example, we hear a lot about hurricanes, we hear a lot this phrase, 500-year storm. That means this is a storm that is expected to have a 1 in 500 chance of hitting a given area in any given year. That means you know, you think the length of 500 years, 500 years ago, there were basically no Europeans in the Americas. So we're talking about a storm that is was scheduled to hit once in the entire span of time from the settlement of the Americas, the American Revolution, the empire of slavery, the American Civil War, industrialization, uh, World War One, World War Two, all of the disruptions of the end of the 20th century, the Cold War, the end of history, um, 
September 11th, the economic crisis, all of this was supposed to enclose a period that should have been that should have seen one of these such storms. Hurricane Harvey in Houston was the third 500-year storm in three years. So we're talking about um, a rapid intensification and um, speeding up of these weather events. And I think that's really profound. I think it's one reason why American public opinion is moving so quickly, because extreme weather is a grotesque teacher. It inflicts suffering, but it also makes it impossible for us to look away. I think that's um, on some strange, uncomfortable level, probably a sign of progress. I think it's important for people to understand that, you know, it's true that the planet, as deniers say, the planet has been hotter than this in the past. It, it has been hotter than it will ever get, probably, because of um, anthropogenic climate change. But humans were not around in those, mm -hmm. at those points in time, and they probably wouldn't have been able to survive. The last time the planet was four degrees warmer, there were palm trees in the Arctic. We're talking about a, a transformation that would be so complete, the planet would be made really unrecognizable to anyone like you and me familiar with the world as it exists today. And we're already living in a climate that is warmer than at any point in human history ever before, which means that never, there has never been a single human who walked on a planet as hot as the one that you and I walk on today. What that means for what the human animal will be able to endure and what human civilization will be able to endure, again, these are open questions. But I think while we will survive, while we will endure in some form, I think we don't yet know exactly what form, and we don't yet know exactly um, transformed in what ways. I think those impacts are likely to be bigger and more profound than we tend to assume, because we look around and we see the modern world, we think it's eternal. We think our cities are, are fortresses against nature, but we all live within nature, and when nature is transformed, we will be impacted too, no matter where we live, no matter how rich we are. And that means, I think, that the century that we're walking into now mm. will be defined by climate change in much the same way that, say, earlier eras were defined by modernity or financial capitalism. I'm just curious, because you've done such an incredible job of storytelling in this book to bring it to a human term. Uh, and, of course, to you and to me, the science is clear. Why is it, though, you say in the book uh, that this book is about what warming means to the way we live on this planet. Why then the crumpled carcass of a bee on the cover and say not a burned out cityscape? Because you're not afraid uh, to make certain that we know just at the beginning of the book where you say uh, that um, your response is that uh, it's much, much worse uh, than you think. And so some have called you an alarmist, and you're not afraid of that. You're saying your response is you should be too. So why not put something more human on the cover? I'm just curious, because I don't want somebody not to buy this book, because they think it's about, say, the birds and the bees, and not about us. Yeah, I, I mean, honestly, that's a question for my publishers, not for me. <laughs> I think that there's some poetic power in a simpler, simpler image rather than a more complicated image. And whenever I look at depictions of climate future, I tend to find them sort of corny personally. So I think there's something nice about a, I think this is a kind of a more refined approach, but I think you're probably right that there's also um, a graphic power to something that was a little bit more illustrative. But you're right also that this is a book that is not primarily concerned about animal life and, and the impact that climate change will have on that. Although those impacts are quite dramatic. Well, we can extrapolate life. that. <laughs> if yeah. it's having that impact on us, we can extrapolate. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, but I, I also, um, you know, I think that the impacts that are likely to that are likely unfold on humans are profound enough and immediate enough. They should really preoccupy our attention. And while it is, in a certain sense, a tragedy that, say, 60% of vertebrate mammals have died since 1970, as the World Wildlife Fund estimates, or that perhaps as many as 75% of the planet's insects may have died in recent decades, as some studies have suggested, for me... You know, I'm a lifelong New Yorker. I've lived in cities forever. I don't really think of myself as a nature person or an environmentalist. I've never had a pet. For me, the human impacts are much more profound and mobilizing. And I don't think we need to look at the sad plight of animals to feel the tragedy or the motivation that are contained in the story. I think that the incredible suffering that we are scheduled to impose on ourselves and future generations 
is dramatic enough. And the scale of that suffering is a reminder of just how much power we retain over the climate. When I talk about some of these climate horrors, they seem so overwhelming, they're basically unthinkable. But they will only happen if we make them happen. They will only happen if we continue to produce carbon and put it into the atmosphere. And if we find a way to avoid doing that, they won't happen. I think that's a really important thing for people to keep in mind, that while we're on course for some really, really awful futures, that it is also entirely up to us whether we arrive at those destinations or come up short. And that'll always be the case, no matter how hellish, no matter how hot it gets, it will always be the case that the main input determining the future climate of the planet is human activity. And if we don't want to impose more suffering on the future, we can choose not to. The question is, will we have the will to do that? Will we have the wherewithal to do that? David, what and about the micro opportunities? Because you describe yourself, I think, as a non-recycling city dweller who doesn't love camping. What is the individual's role in restoring the planet? Uh, is that significant in this? Or whose responsibility is it? Well, I think it's responsibility that we share at every level, all of us, but in different ways. So, you know, I think there are the, those people who are motivated to really take action in their own lives. I applaud them for it. I think that's valuable for a number of reasons, but also it's probably fulfilling. And I think that's important, too. When I look more globally, it seems to me that individual actions have a relatively trivial impact when compared to the impact of policy. And therefore, I think that the, by far the most important thing that anyone can do is to mobilize politically, even if just at the level of voting, to make sure that our leaders prioritize climate change, not just as one among many goals, but as an overarching, all-governing, all-encompassing imperative that we must take action on this now or else all of the other things that we care about politically will become harder and harder to achieve. And I think that that's by far the most important thing, more important than what we eat at dinner, how much we travel and in what way. But that's not to say I don't think anybody should take any action. I think everybody should take the action that they feel they can do. Every, every little bit helps and everybody should feel a part of the movement. But I also don't think it's valuable to define commitment to climate change so high that we're asking everybody to give up, to completely change their diet and give up meat, to completely give up travel and give up airplanes, give up their car, buy an electric car. I think if we're asking everyone to do that, rather than just asking them to vote to elect different politicians, then we're, we risk alienating a lot of people who would otherwise be quite supportive of aggressive policy action, which is where all the work really will get done. After all of this, in terms of uh, the uh, profound way that you have described what you see in the future, uh, you also tell us that you have a young child and you say, quote, she will watch the world doing battle with a genuinely existential threat. She will be living it quite literally, the greatest story ever told. It may well bring a happy ending. After all that you've extrapolated, one might ask, is that serious? I mean, saying or trying to objectify this and uh, almost looking at it as a bystander that she might actually have a, a good ending to this. I mean, how do we do that? Uh, and what kinds of decisions have to be made now to ensure that anything like that is uh, remotely possible? Well, I think it's all a matter of perspective. So I think if you anchor your expectations on the world as it exists today, the climate as it exists today, I think there's basically, basically no chance that we are able to stabilize the system at something close to today's climate, which means we're, it's likely going to get considerably warmer and that will impose quite a lot of suffering on the world. In that, from that perspective, I have a kind of pessimistic read. But I think it's more realistic to base our expectations off the baseline of the trajectory that we're on, which is at getting us to about 4 or 4.3 degrees later this century by most estimates. If that's the baseline, then anything we do to pull up short of that counts as progress and is a reason for optimism. And I think there are a lot of reasons to think that we could do that and could, you know, it's sort of foolish, I think, to make particular predictions since there's so many open questions about exactly what course the world will take over the next few decades. But I certainly think it's possible that even likely that we avoid some of these truly horrific impacts that would hit us at, say, three and a half or four degrees of warming. What it would require to do that is a complete reimagination of just about everything about modern life from agriculture to industry to transportation to energy production. And that would be a really monumental achievement. It would require, as the UN says, a kind of global war footing. And I don't think that's going to happen soon, which means I don't think that we're likely to achieve those goals through conventional decarbonization alone. And what that opens up 
is the possibility for what are called negative emissions technologies, which are a variety of approaches that could suck carbon out of the atmosphere rather than putting more of it into the atmosphere. These technologies are preliminary. They've really only been tested in kind of laboratory settings and certainly not at any scale like we'd need them to be to really buy us considerably more time for decarbonization. But they do work. We do have technology that can take carbon out of the atmosphere. It's expensive, but it does work. And I suspect over the coming decades, we'll be deploying them more and more and they will become a bigger and bigger part of the solution, a bigger, bigger part of the way that we might keep the climate at something close to, say, two degrees of warming this century. And just how quickly we deploy them and at what scale, again, these are open questions, but I hope we do it as aggressively as we can and as emphatically as we can, as immediately as we can, because we need all the help we can get. Well, David Wallace-Wells, uh, congratulations on this book, The Uninhabitable Earth. And many are comparing it to Rachel Carson back in 1962 and Silent Spring and the impact that had on pesticides. I thank you so much for coming by today on America Trends. Thanks for having me. America Trends podcast is part of the MHNR Network, mhnrnetwork.com.